Once the Buddha was extolling the advantages of breath meditation, the benefits that could be had from keeping the breath in mind. And one of the monks said, well, I already do breath meditation. So the Buddha asked him, well, what kind of breath meditation do you do? And the monk replied, I sit breathing, putting away any thoughts of desire for the past or future, and any irritation in the present moment, i.e. developing a sense of equanimity for what's arising and passing away in the present moment. And that was it. That was his method. And the Buddha responded, well, that's, that is a form of breath meditation. I don't say that it's not, but it's not how you get the most benefits out of the breath. And so we proceeded to teach breath meditation in a much fuller way. And it's important that you look at how the Buddha taught breath meditation. Because you begin to realize how proactive the kind of meditation was, and also the steps that he gave. Many of them were more like questions. He says, do this, but without fully explaining how you might go about doing it, which means that you have to test and explore. The first two steps are simply practice in discerning the breath. Discerning when it's long, discerning when it's short. It helps sensitize you to how the breath feels. And you begin to notice which kind of breathing feels best. He simply mentions long or short, but there are other qualities that you can look at as well. Deep or shallow. Heavy or light, fast or slow. In other words, you want to get in touch with the physical sensations of when you breathe in, where do you feel the sensation of breathing? When you breathe out, where do you feel it? Because the Buddha doesn't say that you have to focus on any particular point. He simply says, bring mindfulness to the fore. In other words, be very clear about what you're keeping in mind, which is the meaning of mindfulness. To have a purpose in mind, what you're planning to do, and then your ability to remember that. That's mindfulness. Actually watching what's going on is called alertness. But the Buddha doesn't say where in the body you have to focus. In fact, you may want to Ask yourself, when you breathe in, exactly where do you feel it? Put aside your preconceived notions of where you should be feeling it, and where do you actually feel the breath? Where is it comfortable? Where is it uncomfortable? From those steps in learning how to sensitize yourself to the breathing, then the Buddha moves on to a whole series of trainings. in which you have to learn how to do something. You will something to happen. This is where the breath meditation gets more proactive. The first training is to learn how to breathe in and out sensitive to the entire body. And then notice the state of mind you're trying to create. It's an expansive state of mind. You're conscious of the breath, but you're also trying to be aware of the body as a whole, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes. The question is, how do you do that? Some people find it very easy to go straight to the whole body. Other people have to explore, have to work up to it. To it. And one of the ways of doing that is going through the body section by section, noticing how the different parts of the body feel as you breathe in, how they feel as you breathe out. And to help you along, you might want to decide to make it more comfortable 
as you focus on a particular part of the body, notice, is there tension there? When you breathe in, do you build up tension in that part of the body? When you breathe out, are you holding on to tension? This is actually moving into the fourth step, which is to calm what they call bodily fabrication, which is the effect of the breath on the sensation of the body. But you can combine the two. As you go through the body, working up to this full body awareness, you can also learn how to calm the breath. So the sensation of breathing feels good. And you begin to realize that the breathing is not just a process that you feel at one or two points in the body. The entire body is involved in the breathing process, or it can be involved in the breathing process. And the more it becomes a whole body process, the more refreshing it feels. This moves on to steps five and six, breathing, training yourself to breathe in and out with a sense of refreshment, with a sense of ease and pleasure. So you work on that. Trying to find what rhythm of breathing is best for each part of the body as you go through it until you're ready to settle down, say, at one spot. And then think of your awareness spreading from that one spot to fill the whole body. And then you go back again and follow the the strict order of the steps, which is, okay, then once you're aware of the whole body, allow the sensations of the, sensations of the breathing to calm down. Then you begin to notice that your ideas about the breath will have an effect on how calm the breath can get. You can perceive the breath in different ways. Again, as a whole body process, think of the the breath coming in and out every pore of the skin. And there is oxygen exchange happening at the skin. The more wide open your pores are, the more oxygen gets exchanged. So it's a good idea to think of the, the skin being wide open. So that the rib cage, or the muscles of the rib cage, can do less work. The more still the mind, just hold that perception in mind that the breath can come in and go out from any direction through all the parts of your body. And you notice that there are subtle sensations in the body as you breathe in, as you breathe out, that correspond to the grosser sensations of the, the movement of the rib cage, the movement of the diaphragm. To allow those subtle sensations to blend together in a way that feels harmonious. Think of every part of the body being connected. Here you're using one of the aggregates, the aggregate of perception, to help calm the breath down. And you notice that it does also induce a sense of rapture. Well, in some cases, it's not quite as strong as what we would normally call rapture. It's more a sense of refreshment. The body feels full, satisfied. It's as if every little cell in the body was getting to breathe. And there'll be a sense of ease that comes along with us. Once the body's been really refreshed that way, things will begin to calm down even further. This is where you get sensitive to what the, body, what the Buddha calls mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. You've already noticed how changing the perception of how you breathe will have an effect on the breathing process. It also has an effect on the mind. It calms things down. So you can continue exploring exactly what perceptions help to calm the mind down. What you're doing is learning both calm and insight at the same time. The Buddha very rarely divides these into two diametrically opposed. Well, he never calls them diametrically opposed qualities in the mind. But he does point out that they are two qualities in the mind that should ideally be working together. You calm things down at the same time you gain insight into the workings of the mind. 
here you begin to see that on the one hand there's the impact that the breathing can have on the mind. The, the more soothing the breath becomes, the more the mind is willing to settle down in the present and feel soothed by it. But at the same time, you also see the impact of the mind and the breath. The way you perceive the breath is going to change the way the body actually breathes. Your mental picture of the breath, of the breathing process, will have an impact on which parts of the body then actually get involved in the breathing process. Ultimately, the Buddha say you can sit here just looking at awareness, the awareness of the mind itself as it's watching the breath. This is an important faculty in the meditation, is learning how to observe the mind. It's as if there, almost as if there are two minds, the mind being observed and the mind doing the observing. Then you can watch the state of the mind as it stays with the breath. Then you begin to notice that sometimes it's steady and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can maintain its concentration, sometimes it can't. Sometimes it feels refreshed and gladdened by doing the meditation. Other times it feels like the meditation is more of a chore, something you're just going through the motions. You want to be able to read your mind in this way, and then learn to provide it with whatever it needs. How do you gladden the mind when it's feeling a little bit down, or a little bit bored by the process? What can you do to make it more interesting? The analogy the Buddha gives is of a good cook. It's so good that the cook is now working in the palace. Now, to get to be a good cook working in a palace, you've got to be very sensitive to what you're, say, you're working for a prince. You have to be sensitive to what the prince likes. And the prince isn't going to come down to the kitchen and say, hey, tomorrow I'd like fried chicken, or tomorrow I'd like tofu, or whatever. The prince will sit there at the table and he'll reach for this food and not reach for that food. Take a lot of this and take only a little bit of that. So you've got to notice that. You have to pick up on the signs that the prince is sending. Whether he's sending them consciously or not, you want to watch him. As King Ashoka once said in his one of his edicts, the people who worked for him, if they were going to please him, they had to know what he wanted even before he knew. So you have to be that good at reading your own mind. What does the mind need right now? Sometimes it gets bored with working with the breath, but you can give it other things to think about. You can develop qualities of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. You can think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. All these are valid topics of meditation. And they're there to inspire the mind, gladden the mind. You can think about the good times you've been generous in the past, when you didn't really have to share something, but you felt moved to share. Or you could have gotten away with harming somebody or taking something away from them, but you didn't. So think about those times. They help bring joy to the practice. In other words, like the cook, you learn how to read your mind and then provide it with whatever food it needs. The same with the issue of steadying the mind. When the mind is feeling kind of wobbly, how do you get it so that it's really fully here in the present moment? You might want to go back and review some of the steps of the meditation. Which ones are you forgetting? Have you forgotten to stay with the whole body? Have you forgotten how to give rise to a sense of rapture and refreshment? Well, go back and do those things. Or you might be able to change the way you perceive the breathing. You think of the breath going down into your bones. Focus on the breathing sensations in your hands and feet. Some people find that focusing on one spot at a time is not enough to keep them really transfixed, so give yourself two spots. I knew an old woman in Thailand when I was first getting involved in meditation. She was a retired school teacher. And 
And she said one of the quickest ways of getting the mind to settle down and stay really focused in the present moment was to think of focusing on the sensations in the head and the sensations at the base of the spine. Think of those as two breathing centers. And you find that the, the effort involved in keeping two things going at once, think of a, a line connecting the two so it makes it a single sensation, that really steadies the mind, focuses it, gets it to settle down and stay still. Another step the Buddha recommends is learning how to release the mind. Now here he's not talking about the ultimate release, but you're learning how to refine your concentration. One of the important ways of gaining insight in the, in the process of developing concentration is to be able to analyze how things are going. And notice the different levels of concentration. Sometimes you settle down and you're still sort of hovering around the breath as you try to adjust it. And otherwise, you can let yourself just simply be bathed by the breathing without having to analyze much at all. What you've done is you've moved from using directive thought and evaluation to help with the concentration to the point where you don't need them anymore. You can let them go. There's a much greater sense of refreshment that comes, a greater sense of fullness as you're one with the breath as opposed to hanging outside. That's one way of releasing the mind. And then you can compare which state is more easeful, which state has more stress. And then you can provide, again, you can provide the mind with what it needs. Once you've learned these ways of dealing with the breath, the workings of your mind become a lot more transparent, just as the breath element in the body becomes more transparent. And that's when you're ready for the work of insight, seeing the inconstancy of anything that's intended, physical or mental. Anything that's fabricated in any way at all, whether it's bodily fabrication or mental fabrication. No matter how easeful and refreshing and stable the mind can be, there's still a, a slight instability, a slight wavering that you can detect. And as a mind develops a sense of dispassion for everything intentional, it begins to gain, be disenchanted, it's had enough of this, then that's when it's really ready to let go, i.e. it stops getting involved in these fabrications, and they stop. And that's when everything gets relinquished, including the path. So this is how you get great benefit, great rewards out of the practice of breath meditation. It's not just a means for calming the mind down a little bit. The breath itself becomes a way of understanding the process of fabrication, both body and mind. And it develops that sense of dispassion, not because you've come into the meditation with a negative attitude. You become dispassionate more because you've learned how to outgrow the exercises that the Buddha set for you. It's like a child outgrowing a, a game. You've played the game enough so you know everything that the game has to offer. You've mastered all the skills, and you're ready for something more. So the dispassion here is more like the dispassion that happens when you naturally grow up, when you mature. It's the dispassion that comes when you realize there must be something better. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, a lot of the meditation is learning simply to accept things as they are and not be too demanding of what you need to be happy. That's not what the Buddha ever taught. He said, notice what things can provide what level of happiness. How far can you push this process of fabrication? Because that's what you're doing with as you breathe in, in this way. You're exploring the potentials for bodily fabrication and mental fabrication to see how far they can go. 
once you've explored your limits, you want something better, you realize that you can't look at fabrication, these acts of intention, for true happiness any further. You've got to go deeper. You've got to learn how to abandon even those intentions. So you maintain a high standard for what's going to be happy. In fact, you heighten your standards for what's going to be happy as you practice. But you just begin to realize that in the past you've been looking in the wrong place. You've been looking at things that are fabricated. Is it possible for there to be something totally unfabricated, totally unintended? You look for that. Something that lies even beyond the, the intentions of equanimity, and the intentions of calm or stillness, the intentions of insight. You can't get to that without having developed these other skills, because these are the skills that refine your powers of awareness. They're taking you not to a place that you could create, which is what you've been doing all along. But it's something that you couldn't find without having to do in the creations, because the creations sensitize you. They clear away a lot of the, the static in your experience of the present, a lot of the interference. And they sensitize you to very, very subtle things. It's like tuning in on a radio. The more sensitive your ear, the more you can tell whether you're turned, tuned in to the radio station very precisely or off a little bit. If you're off a little bit, there's going to be static interference. So you keep tuning in, tuning in as your ear gets better and better. You get so that you don't want even the least little bit of static. And that's how you get right on target. This is how the breath leads you all the way to nirvana. Of course, the breath doesn't do that itself, but if you follow the Buddha's steps, the areas where he recommends that you explore, experiment, the breath does become a path. So it's a path that's right here, happening all the time to try to take advantage of what's right here and see how far it can go.